Hello, and welcome to the July 2021 edition of the Thought Leaders Lectures, and greetings from UTMB Health, proud sponsor of tonight's lecture. I'm Dr. Erin McGough, Director of Simulation at UTMB's Health Education Center. Tonight, we will introduce you to NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, the best available environment on Earth for astronauts to prepare for work and travel in space. Like the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, UTMB's Health Education Center is a state-of-the-art simulated training environment, an invaluable tool for teaching future healthcare providers of all disciplines. The simulated hospital includes 77 beds, two operating rooms, an intensive care unit, patient rooms for adults, children, moms and babies, an obstetric suite, a post-anesthesia care unit, virtual skills labs, and more than 60 mannequins creating real-life medical situations. Simulation in both medicine and aerospace is the next best thing to reality, allowing astronauts and medical students alike to gain essential skills and knowledge safely and efficiently. We hope you will enjoy the glimpse of the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, a truly unique training environment. Thank you for joining us. Hello, I'm William T. Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston. A nonprofit science center, we provide the public with dynamic science and space exploration learning experiences. We also serve as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. Our exhibits and programs share the story of human space exploration, past, present, and future. With more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world through on-site and virtual experiences. Presented by the University of Texas Medical Branch, this month's program will dive into how astronauts train for EVAs while in space at NASA's Sunny Carter Training Facility Neutral Buoyancy Lab or more popularly known as the NBL. Our Thought Leader series features space engineering and science experts from across the country who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Through our Thought Leader series and other programming, Space Center Houston makes science and learning about space exploration accessible to everyone. This summer, our exhibits and programming are themed around pushing human limits. Guests are afforded a rare look at how astronauts are training for human exploration for travel to the moon and Mars. You can discover how astronauts train on land, underwater, and beyond. Only Space Center Houston takes the general public behind the scenes to NASA Johnson Space Center, the home of astronaut training. We provide new seasonal exhibits, so there's always something new. You can experience our new summer exhibit, Beyond Human Limits, now through September 6. You can also meet an astronaut, train like an astronaut, have breakfast with an astronaut, and more at our summer event, Astronaut Days, August 5th through the 8th. You can also board the NASA Tram Tour to see the astronaut training facilities and the Apollo Mission Control Room. You can book your time tickets, admission tickets at spacecenter.org. And now on our July Thought Leader Series panel, Neutral Buoyancy Lab presented by UTMB, we're going to explore this incredible topic of astronaut training for spacewalks. Our panelists today include MBL flight lead, Danny Brandon, MBL dive ops specialist, Christy Molas, and astronaut Bill MacArthur. Our first panelist is Danny Brandon, who is the MBL flight lead. Danny currently manages MBL external customer and facility projects related to development operations and future capabilities. He's been part of the team at the MBL since 1999 and was part of the dive team until 2009. His primary focus now is to support MBL operations and hardware integration. Our next presenter, is Christy Molas. Christy is a dive operations specialist at the NBL. She's held many different positions at the pool, including safety diver, dive supervisor, environmental control systems operator, and test director. She's been a recreational diver since 2000, a professional diver since 2011, and joined the NBL dive team in 2017. Her responsibilities include assisting astronauts in their EVA training underwater. And our final presenter is Bill MacArthur, a retired astronaut and U.S. Army Colonel. A veteran of four space flights, Bill has logged 224 days, 22 hours, 28 minutes, and 10 seconds in space, including 24 hours and 21 minutes of spacewalks. Bill retired from NASA in June 2017 as the Director of Safety and Mission Assurance for NASA Johnson Space Center. I'm so delighted to welcome our panelists, Danny Christie and Bill. We'll begin with opening marks by Danny Brandon. Danny. Hey, thank you, William. Uh, thank you for having us here today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, to talk about the NBL. And when we look at the NBL, a big question that comes out sometimes is what is the NBL? 
Well, the NBL is one of the world's largest indoor pools that can support multiple large scale operations. And it's located at NASA's Stony Connor Trading Facility in Houston, Texas. Our primary purpose is to support astronaut training in the pool for procedure development, hardware verification, refinement of time critical operations necessary to ensure mission success during spacewalks. Essentially, we have a really big pool uh, where we're trying to simulate zero gravity. And to do that here, we take large uh, life-size, we call them mock-ups, but they're models or modules of the space station. And we put them down in the water uh, for the astronauts to train their EVAs or e extravehicular activities. So we refer to them as, as spacewalks. And in that manner, we look to weigh out the astronaut to, to put foam and put weights in certain locations on the astronaut suit so they can simulate a zero gravity environment. Earlier, I mentioned that the NBL was inside the Sony Carter Training Facility, and it's a, a bigger building the NBL is housed in. And when we look at who is Sonny Carter, well, JSC named the facility uh, in honor of the late astronaut ML Sonny Carter, who was instrumental in developing many of the current spacewalking techniques used by the astronauts. Uh, Carter passed on April 5th of 1991 in a commercial plane crash. Carter flew on a Department of Defense shuttle mission in November 1989 and was training for his second flight at the time of his death. So some of the pool features, uh, you'll see this when you first come into the NBL, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. So just to give you uh, some dimensions here, the length is 202 foot by 102 foot and it's 40 feet deep. And uh, it has a volume of 6.2 million gallons of chlorinated fresh water. We keep it at a temperature of about 86 degrees. Uh, this is because we have you know, astronauts in the pool, but also the dive staff that supports the astronaut uh, training in the water. Um, they stay in for prolonged uh, periods of time and, and we want to keep them uh, nice and warm. We also have uh, in the facility two overhead bridge cranes that we use to set the hardware into the pool. And if you can see in the picture there, you can see the uh, mock-ups that we have of the International Space Station uh, in the center of the pool there and, and spread it throughout. Uh, one thing to note is that the pool, even though as large as it is, it's not quite large enough to fit the space station in there for one continuous run. So the MBL has the opportunity or the challenge to fit certain sections of the space station hardware and components in a manner that supports the training the astronauts are wanting to conduct. Uh, and that may take, mean taking apart certain sections of the configuration to, to move it around on the pool to, to support their, their mission and training. Uh, we also have uh, some davit cranes along the pool side and, and some jib cranes that we use for putting hardware in and out. And we also have a, an extensive video and audio uh, set up for the NBL to, to film and be able to communicate to the astronauts and the team as these uh, types of events are going on. Uh, to look at how the NBL was, was built, back in 1991, the building was actually built for space station freedom. And from what I understand, it was actually built for an air bearing floor. So, so the floor had to be very level to support these platforms that could uh, move space station hardware around, which is a little ironic because you know, eventually the, the building was repurposed and the floor was just dug right out for the pool. So that happened in 1995. It took a lot of dirt being pulled out and a lot of concrete to be put in and 30 days to fill the tank with water. So the tank walls, are actually 20 feet above the ground and they're, they're five foot thick walls and 20 feet below the ground. So towards the base, the walls are five foot thick and towards the top, they taper up to a, a two foot thick wall. Concrete on the floor is six foot thick. It had to be done in one continuous pour and it required 528 concrete trucks or uh, 5,276 cubic yards of concrete. The pool wall, floor and pool deck footings contain uh, 1,400 tons of reinforced steel bars. 350 concrete trucks were required to, to pour the walls. So the walls were built uh, and designed to concave inward so that when the tank was filled with water, it could expand outward and become vertical. The tank took nearly four weeks to fill, and, and there was two reasons why. One, because uh, the city 
was only able to provide a four inch uh, water line to fill the tank. So it took an extremely long time to get 6.2 million gallons of water in, but also that was uh, by design so that the pool walls could settle out gradually. Uh, that, that would actually take care of some of the taper that was at the top of the pool. Uh, so some of the support systems and hardware that is a part of the MBL uh, to support, you know, the actual pool, uh, the training events that go on, and the operations uh, consists of our water treatment uh, system. Uh, this you know, filters the, the pool water. It, it, it takes care of the, the chemicals that are required to keep it clean. We also have our breathing gas systems uh, is our facility out back that helps uh, blend the gas that we breathe and pipe it to the pool deck for the subjects uh, in the pool and also the divers. We have a clean room that uh, will O2 clean all of our scuba components and diving components or any other components that we need to clean thoroughly. We also, uh, a big part of the Sony Carter training facility and our, our training at the NBL is our uh, logistics and mock-up facility or, or our LMF. And it is our, our shop where we fabricate and build a lot of the structures that you'll see in the water. So if, if we need to build a, a certain ORU or, or uh, the hardware that needs is critical for space training, we have that capability to do in-house in our facility uh, to get it ready for the next uh, mission. Uh, we also have a, a functional space station remote manipulator system. Uh, this is a SSRMS. This is the robotic arm that you'll see on the International Space Station that is used to translate uh, hardware and astronauts from worksite to worksite. And we also, uh, of course, have full service dive operations, including scuba and surface supply dive systems, and, and a team of, of divers that support all of these events in the, in the water. Um, another uh, aspect uh, of support for the MBL operations is our on-site engineering and technical services with expertise in mock-up design, robotic systems, and life support systems. And this also includes a great admin staff and just a, a support team for the MBL and all the events that uh, we, we support. So some facts on the astronaut training that we perform at the MBL. We have trained over 150 EVA. So spacewalks have been trained and practiced in, our, in the pool. 148 of those are International Space Station, uh, 13 uh, Hubble missions, and we have over 327,000 dive hours collectively uh, between the divers that are certified and the, the subjects in the pool. So, so just a little, a uh, few factoids there about the training that we have done thus far at the NBL. So when I first started at the NBL, we were just starting the space station and we were doing a lot of Hubble training. So from Hubble to Space Station to now looking at uh, performing Artemis training in the pool, uh, we were actually doing 1-6-G uh, evaluations and testing in the water as if we had uh, you know, subjects on the moon. We're trying to simulate that in addition to the current operations that we support. So the MBL team utilizes the facility capabilities and resources to meet the user's needs for training. This includes opportunity to evolve and create new capabilities for the MBL. So, so one of the things at the MBL that we're always trying to do for, for all of our users is look at your requirements. You know, what is necessary for your event, for your run, for your training? And then we have a, a great set of resources and staff with, with experience to take those requirements to take and look at those objectives and, and see how we can implement that type of training in the water. What can we do specifically at the MBL to make it more real, realistic for you, uh, for the astronauts that are there, for their specific training needs, um, and, and for the rest of the users of the facility, you know, what, what can we do to make the experience a successful experience for training? Some of the other uh, operations that we support at the MBL are commercialization and external customers. After the retirement of the space shuttle, the MBL was purposely you know, working to see what we could do with some of the excess capacity. And the priority was and still is uh, maintaining NASA's uh, mission for ISS operations and maintenance, but also uh, now to evaluate what we can do with external customers with uh, excess capacity. And in that regard, you know, we came up with, with a vision and, and, and NASA at the MBL, the vision for commercialization was to establish, uh, maintain NASA's unique world-class facilities while offsetting costs to the government by providing industry 
access and the spirit of furthering technology and science. So we've done a lot of different operations from having oil and gas industry, from having underwater technology companies come and test some of their systems in regards to wireless and autonomous vehicles, remote operated vehicles, uh, training. We've also done safety and survival training at the MBL. We've done an array of different types of commercial customer training and events in the facility. We continue to look for opportunities to bring in those customers to support that capacity that we have at the MBL. It's a really big deal and it really allows us to become more versatile in supporting you know, NASA's mission and the resources at the MBL. So another part of the external work that we do uh, that's actually part of NASA's mission. And so the MBL also supports the development of landing and recovery procedures and equipment for nominal recovery, crew rescue, and spacecraft retrieval for both of NASA's Artemis and commercial crew programs. This includes providing trained MBL personnel to support MBL and at sea training events. So we will do training inside of the MBL for Artemis program, and that includes specifically EGS, which is uh, exploration ground systems, where they look to do the uh, rescue, uh, recovery, and, and uh, spacecraft retrieval of the Orion uh, capsule. Uh, we do that in-house and offshore, and we also support the commercial crew program for their uh, capsi capsule recovery, landing and recovery efforts. For those operations that we do and for the vision that the NBL has to support astronaut training and all the other diverse events that we have in the facility, overall, the NBL is, is a world-class facility that strives to meet NASA's goals for the ISS exploration and NBL customers. And that can seem like a specific small amount of things. However, the ISS exploration and the customer facility are vast. We have uh, continuing to look at additional things that we can do to support upcoming NASA priorities and missions, along with external customers and along with our landing recovery efforts. So in that vein, we look at our division mission statement. It says we put the human and human space flight for exploration, discovery, and inspiration. If they live and work in space, we prepare them. If it breaks, we fix it. If it can't be done, we find a way. And I really feel that that statement encompasses the attitudes and the, the spirit at the MBL with our drive and focus on finding a way to best suit the astronauts and mission needs as well as our customers. And that really rolls into our foundations of flight operations. This is our FOD directorate that, that we're under at the MBL. And there's three big foundations here to hit on it. The first one is to instill within ourselves these qualities essential to professional excellence. In, in that there's a subset of principles, and one of them is discipline, competence, confidence, responsibility, toughness, teamwork, and vigilance. The, the second one is to always be aware that suddenly and unexpectedly, we may find ourselves in a role where our performance has ultimate consequences. And that's a real big one. That's kind of a big deal. At the NBO, where we're training astronauts inside of a pool through life support systems. We want to we put the rigor in to, to understanding that if we don't get this right, we could have issues, we could have problems. And we focus in ensuring that we are uh, mitigating any type of hazards and, and ensuring that we put forth our best our best foot forward and, and understand that this is serious work. And number three is to recognize that the greatest error is not to have tried and failed, but that in trying, we do not give our best effort. And in, in that regard, you know, that's something EMBL is, is, is always focused to do. We do a lot of testing out here, testing and evaluations where uh, we want to see what the outcome is. And it may, there may be a pass and fail criteria, and we want to evaluate that. But we know if we don't give it our best, uh, we're not going to have the successful outcome, uh, pass or fail, um, that we're looking for. Great, Danny. That is absolutely fantastic. I, I'm just fascinated by the MBL, such a unique facility, and you consider all the complexity to create this amazing space. I've got like a ton of questions. I'm really looking forward to our Q&A portion later in our program. I'm now delighted to turn it over to Christy. Hi, everyone. My name is Christy Mellis. I'm a diver here at the MBL. I'm also a dive supervisor an ECS operator or environmental control systems operator and a test director in training. Hopefully be signed off soon. So I'll be a newly qualified test director here at the MBL. 
I have been diving since 2000. I got my certification when I was in college. I went to A&M in Galveston as a marine biologist and I graduated in 2001 with my marine biology degree. I never in a million years thought it would bring me to NASA, but I'm super happy to be here. I'm honored to be a diver and just really excited about the future of our facility. I started diving professionally in 2011 as a diver at the Downtown Aquarium in Houston. And as a diver in the Downtown Aquarium, I was responsible for cleaning uh, the tanks, feeding the fish, and just assisting in general the biologists with whatever needed to be done. And diving in an aquarium is a very unique experience in itself because unlike diving in the ocean where the animals swim away from you when you're down there, in an aquarium they actually come up to you because they associate us with food. So they come up, they eat right out of your hand, uh, they rub up against you like your pet at home would do. So you really get to develop relationships with these animals in the aquarium. So it's very, very, very unique. And anyone that has an opportunity to go dive in an aquarium or snorkel in one, uh, please take that opportunity because it's unlike any other experience in the world. And it's also very comparable to diving in the MVL because this also is unlike any other experience in the world. Uh, so I feel very fortunate to be here. This picture shows uh, basically a split screen between the pool deck and the control rooms on top and then what you would see underwater from a diver's perspective. In the bottom right hand corner you can see the astronauts down there and the whole support team that's around them helping them out. Uh, so I became an NBL diver in 2017 and I've only been here four short years but I've done a lot and learned a lot in that very short time. So our spacesuits are very heavy. They're about 300 pounds. So in order to put them in the pool, we have to pick them up with a big crane, which you see to your right hand side. And I'll show a video in a little bit showing that. And as Danny said, we have to use neutral buoyancy to train our astronauts in the pool. And that just simulates weightlessness. And uh, when we lift them in, in with the crane, our divers are there to pull them off the donning stand and then perform an initial way out, which you'll see in a video in just a second. And as Danny said, our divers breathe a blend of nitrox and we wear two sets of tanks on our backs at all times. The astronauts are in the water for about six hours at a time, so we need three teams of divers. We have a first, second, and third team, and whoever gets in for the first two hours usually gets back in for the last two hours. And then in between, you have a second team set of divers to take up that slack. So we have three different categories of divers. Our first category is safety divers. Now the safety divers are there to essentially look out for the astronauts overall safety. And we're trained very heavily in what to do in emergency procedures. So if there happens to be something that goes wrong with the suit or something that goes wrong with the person inside the suit, say they go unconscious or they start feeling sick or they start throwing up, we are trained very specifically on what to do in each of those scenarios. So number one, we're looking out for the safety of the astronaut in the water. Uh, the astronaut can't swim themselves around in the pool because that suit is so heavy and it's under pressure. The suits are pressurized to four PSI. So we really have to be there to help them maneuver and assist them in getting from one location to another or in egressing them in an emergency. A safety diver's uh, second primary job is to be on top of the way out all day. So as far as neutral buoyancy goes, we are constantly adjusting their way out with weights and foam, as Danny said earlier, and they've got weight packs on their feet. They have weight packs on their lower back, their upper back and their chest. So depending on their body type, uh, we're moving those weights around or foam around to keep them in the orientation that they would like to be in to simulate weightlessness. And sometimes if they want to be on their back, you know, we have to adjust that way out so that their feet are a little bit lighter. And then when they wanna be heads up, we've got to adjust it. So the safety divers are really working all day long on that way out. And the camera diver, which you see in the center picture, is there to just record the entire day's operation. If they need to pull footage for some reason, 
for training purposes from that run that they did in the pool, they have the ability to. The camera diver also records any emergency situations that may arise. So if there's something that goes wrong with the robotic arm, which you see in the background, the TC or the arm operator might ask the camera diver to please get footage of the whole thing. So that camera diver is very important. Uh, the TC will also instruct the camera diver maybe to get different views of the tasks that they're working on. And uh, so that's a very important job. The last category of diver is a utility diver, and the utility diver's job is just basically to set up the work site for that day or the next day's run. So they do a lot of reconfiguration in the pool and they swap out the tools as the astronaut needs to use them. The tools that they use, we have two different versions of most of them. We have a low fidelity version and a high fidelity version, low fi and high fi. The astronauts, when they're translating around, they don't want to be carrying really heavy tools on their body. So they'll use a lo fi version that's mainly made up of plastic so that it doesn't weigh anything and it's not pulling them down in the water column. When the utility diver uh, goes to switch out the hi fi tool, is when the astronaut actually goes to use that tool and it's the working tool. So here's the video that's going to show you the astronauts going into the water on the donning stand. And you can see that the donning stand is attached by a big yellow crane. And they're going to put them in the water now. And this just gives you sort of a diver's perspective of what it looks like to be a safety diver or a camera diver. And here you have the safety divers. They swim up to the subject as soon as they go in the water and they're going to pat down the subject and make sure that there's no air trapped in the suit and make sure that they don't have any leaks coming from the suit and any of the connecting joints. Uh, you can see they're patting down the gloves right now and they're sort of waving off the bubbles to just get a better view of all of the connecting joints on the suit to make sure that there are no leaks. Uh, the suits are, you know, they're 20 years old or older and so it's not uncommon for one to get a leak somewhere and sometimes a leak is no big deal and other times a leak is bad enough to where the suit engineer is not comfortable with it so they'll have them pull them out and readjust things and then put them back in and once they're happy with how the suit looks the suit engineer will get a final go and the test director will instruct the safety divers to go ahead and pull them off the donning stand and perform their initial way out so the initial way out happens just so that we can ensure that the subject is easily controlled by at least one safety diver. Uh, when the subject goes down the downline, we don't want it to be too difficult for them. You know, if they're too heavy, they're going to go down too fast. And if they're too light, then they're going to have a really hard time pulling themselves down the downline to the bottom of the pool. And the subjects also have an umbilical attached to the back of them, as you can see. And that umbilical is their life support system. So as an ECS operator on certain days, I'm in charge of really um, setting up that system and controlling it throughout the day. So I control the gas that they breathe, uh, the water that they use for their cooling. They're wearing a what's called an LCVG underneath that suit, and it's got tubes running through it that they use for their cooling. It stands for liquid cooling and ventilation garment. So that's really important when the subjects are working hard, uh, they might ask the ECS operator for more cooling. And so we can either bump up their cooling or take it down depending on uh, how they're feeling while they're working. And that thing that they just attach to the back of the subject, that's called a safer. And they basically just have to wear that. You can see it down at the bottom of their suit. Um, it's for volumetric purposes so that they can get a better idea of their spatial awareness in the pool. The SAFER is the simplified aid for extravehicular rescue and that would allow an astronaut if they accidentally came off of station while they're up there in space, it's enough uh, propulsion to get them back onto station. So it's used in an emergency. And that last video just showed you a little bit of them doing the way out. OK, so this slide is just a fun slide to show you the comparison and how large the astronaut actually is compared to the divers and the position that we would like to have the astronaut in while they're doing their training. 
Uh, we would like them to be in a heads up position with a slight tilt, usually at about a 45 degree angle so that they can work properly. Most of the time they're going to be working in a heads up position at a 45 degree angle right where their tools and their mini workstation is. So we're really excited for the future of the NBL. We've seen a little bit of lunar training so far, and these pictures give you an idea of the progression of the training. We've gone from sort of a crawl to a walk to a run. Uh, we started out with the subjects wearing a full face mask with surface supplied air that they're breathing. And then that's the top right picture. And then on the bottom, you can see in the back there that one of the subjects is wearing a full commercial dive helmet and he's got like a modified pliss on his back. So he's when we practice weighing them out to one sixth gravity, which is the gravity on the moon, it's one sixth of what we have here on the Earth. We want to make sure that we're taking into account all of the other factors that are going to be on the suit. So that's why he's wearing that backpack on his back is just to get an idea of the weight that will be back there. And then from there, we graduated on to using the Z2.5. So the Z2.5, you can see in the left two photos and that suit is completely different. It moves different. The joints are articulating so that they have more mobility in their arms and their legs. They're able to stoop down and pick things up and uh, use shovels. Uh, so we're really, really, really excited about that. And this is just a picture to show you sort of the lunar surface that we created on the bottom of the pool. Uh, we had rocks and sand and we have different rock pits that they were able to use shovels in and use different tools for core sampling. So it's been really exciting to see the progression of that. And having said that, I would like to wrap up by showing a short video of what I believe really showcases the capabilities of the MBL for past, present, and future. For 23 years, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory has been at the forefront of refining methodologies and procedures for spacewalks. We are continuously developing and evaluating our strategies to implement and perform complex underwater operations. Each bold new step forward is strengthened through challenges of the past. And although it has been 50 years, with the birth of Artemis, our next big step will be on the lunar surface. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. <laughs> Unlike 50 years ago, this time we're going to stay. Our highly sophisticated and time-proven engineering techniques allow for advanced data collection and analysis. It is these tools and techniques that will empower us to play a crucial role in our mission to return to the moon.
Just as space itself is infinite, we possess limitless potential for taking us farther than ever before. So that's all I have for you guys today. I um, hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, I'm really excited about the future capabilities of the MBL and I can't wait to see what's next. So William, back to you. Thank you, Christy. That was fascinating. And I also have a lot of questions for you when we get to the discussion portion. I'm particularly interested in the preparations for the return to the moon because we know that's right around the corner. And our final speaker, Bill MacArthur. Bill. Thanks, William. It's really a privilege to join Danny and Christy today uh, on the Thought Leader series. Let me explain why. So you might be asking, how good is NBL training? We have an expression in the aviation business, train like you fly. And this is video of me in the NBL <laughs> a long time ago, training for STS-92. Uh, Danny reminded me that he was a safety diver while we were doing this training, and it's just a delight to be working with him again. So the, the PVC pipe framework that you see me manipulating represents a large parabolic antenna called the space to ground antenna, or SGANT. STS-92 was one of the first space station assembly missions where we took new components, major modules up for the space station. And the first task, or one of the first tasks that Leroy Chow and I had was to install the SGANT antenna. The other part of that expression is fly like you train. And here you can see I'm manipulating the actual antenna itself. I released it from the Z1 truss. Oh, by the way, they said, don't be nervous, but this antenna costs $100 million. Okay, that, that'll help you relax. Still, it was just remarkable. The fidelity of the training in the NBL was so good, we felt like we had been there many, many times before. Of course, as we figured out later, Unusually so, we had spent 17 hours in the pool for every hour we spent actually outside uh, Discovery uh, doing our spacewalk. And here I've attached the antenna onto the boom and Leroy is deploying it. And as you can imagine, without the assistance of the divers in the pool, deploying this boom in practice would have been very, very difficult. We did a total of four spacewalks on that mission. My next mission went to the International Space Station on Expedition 12. Now this was a bit different because it's the International Space Station. We actually had two different spacesuits. Uh, on the right, you can see the Russian Orlon spacesuit. And on the left, you can see uh, the US uh, EMU, Extravehicular Mobility Unit. And there you can see my crewmate Valery Tokarev and I posing for our crew photo. Now there was one other thing different about this mission, particularly from a training standpoint. That was because the shuttle fleet was still grounded following the Columbia tragedy, our EVA tasks, and we had an EVA in the EMU and a second EVA in the Orlon, we had not been able to practice the tasks we did. These EVAs were, well, they weren't put together on the fly, so to speak, because there was a lot of training on the ground and we did some virtual training using our laptops. But unfortunately, we couldn't train for the EVAs in the pool, in the NBL. But what we did learn in the NBL was we did a, get a, a set of very good general generic skills so that we were able to perform the tasks that we needed to do. Now you might ask, well, where did we train in the Russian suit? Just like the NBL, the Russians have their own training facility. It's called the Ghidro Laboratoria or Hydro Lab. And here you can see the two facilities compared. The Hydro Lab is, as you can tell, much smaller. It's circular, you know, but otherwise the concept is the same. You put a life-size mock-up 
in the bottom of a deep pool and then you allow astronauts to train in the water to simulate weightlessness. Of course, being smaller, the hydrolab could only contain uh, smaller sections of the, of the space station and you really didn't get the training as, uh, for translating or moving long distances. Well, Christy showed you a lot about suiting up and in the, being in the donning stand from which you're lowered into the pool. Well, it's a little bit different uh, in Russia in the hydrolab. And so instead of climbing up into the suit, the Russian Orlon has a backpack which opens like a door. And so you basically climb down in. So uh, admittedly, it's a little easier to don the suit to put it on. But look at the similarities. Uh, in both places, you're surrounded by a wonderful group of technicians, of engineers, who are whose sole purpose is to ensure that you get the best training possible. Now, you saw Christie's video being lowered down on the donning stand. It's a little bit different in the hydrolab. In the hydrolab, the crane is attached directly to the suit and you're then lowered into the water. From that point on though, you are in a very, very familiar environment. When I got to Russia and started training, uh, the Russian training team said, look, you've been trained in the NBL. You've done spacewalks before. You are ready to get into the Hydra lab and start training. You know, and, and other, other than the slightly different tint to the water, uh, look how similar it is. You have, uh, you have uh, astronauts or cosmonauts, and they are surrounded by these just fantastic people whose whole job is to ensure that you are prepared to go do a very important job. So how good is NBL training? <laughs> well, you know the answer. It's simply outstanding. And why is the NBL training so good? Because of these people, the real heroes, uh, the, the divers, uh, the, uh, the suit technicians and other folks on the pool deck, uh, the training team, uh, the test director and, and, uh, and her crew. That's why we're so successful. And, and so in particular to Danny and Christy, I want to say thank you, and it is truly an honor to join you today. Thank you, Bill. That was absolutely fascinating. And I have a bunch of questions for you as well, particularly about the <laughs> Russian training. I've, I've never seen images of the Hydro Lab or heard details about the training that takes place and the similarities and differences between what we do here in the NBL. But I wanted to start with, it was great to see um, the image Danny had of the values for flight operations and it was clear you could see the legacy from the Apollo era, you know, all the values that are important for NASA and also the fact that without question, it takes a team and you have people with a variety of skills who all enable the success of the mission. And that just uh, was very clear hearing all of your presentations today. So I guess I wanted to start with a question about how do you develop the training protocols? We know that space station requires, you know, of course it was assembled in space astronauts actually had to train to attach portions they do upgrades and repairs so when you know that say there needs to be a new battery or a new antenna how do you go about preparing the training protocols in mbl um, to prepare the astronauts for those missions so i, I can uh take take a stab at that one christy so you know one of the things that we do um at the mbl is we, we work with the the initial users of the facility. So when we have a test conductor come over that's going to be in charge for helping get the astronauts for their mission trained. We meet with them at the at the get go. We want to know the ins and outs of what they're looking for, what their requirements are, how they want to have the pool configured, and what we can do to posture them for success and in, in implementing their their training. Um, so we we step through all of those things, and, and we have processes for that at the NBL. Um, in-house for, for for safety for uh ensuring that you know we're, we're hitting all of our safety milestones but also uh, meeting the fidelity requirements uh for a, a good analog training in the pool and and we, we vet those through our nbl team along with 
the instructors and with the astronauts along the process, implement uh, the, the changes or updates or the configuration of the pool in, before we proceed. So it's, it's, it's a really involved process for ensuring that, you know, we're doing our due diligence uh, to, to provide a, a good training environment. Um, hearing too that it is a team and hearing about your backgrounds, how does someone become employed at MBL? It sounds as though there are a lot of opportunities. So I guess, Christy and Danny, how did you learn about the opportunity to work there and kind of get into the system? So for me, I just, you know, I was a diver at the downtown aquarium and a couple of people that I worked with there actually went to work for the MBL and they recruited me basically so i had a, a foot in the door that way but it depends on what you want to be at the nbl you know if you want to be an engineer then obviously you're going to have to go get your engineering degree if you want to be a diver it's not necessarily wired that you have a degree it is encouraged but they're basically looking for scuba diving experience they want somebody who's very confident in the water who really knows how to dive safely and well so it just depends on what avenue you want to take at the MBL as to what's required. So as part of your training as a, a diver, do you get to actually put on the spacesuits so you can kind of understand what the astronauts go through? Either do you get to try out some of the systems that you're using to support the training? So yes, we actually do have the opportunity to get in the suit. We have what's called egress day. And egress day allows the divers who have been through safety diver certifications and have been fully qualified as a safety diver to get in the suit and get in the water and we practice emergency situations. So our divers that need to be recertified for safety diver or newly training safety divers will practice, say a suited subject goes unconscious or gets nauseated or is throwing up in the suit, then the safety divers will practice getting them safely to the donning stand and out of the pool. And it's a really great experience for us because we get to uh, have suit fits and glove fits just like real astronauts. Uh, the glove fitting actually takes about three hours to do. And it's the gloves are the most important part of the space suit, I think, because you're using your hands most of the time while you're in this suit and it is a pressurized suit it's pressurized to four psi so when you're manipulating a tool it's very important to have the proper glove fit so that your hands don't get worn out you don't get hot spots on your hands and so we just go through that whole suit up suit fit process and get in the pool and pretend to be an astronaut for the day and it really helps us to understand what the astronauts are going through while they're down there you, know, you can't really understand what a spacesuit feels like and how to help them in the water column until you've done it yourself. So, yes. So, Bill, I'm curious, how similar is it being an MBL compared to doing a spacewalk? Uh, would you say that, I mean, clearly you're, you can't completely replicate being in a microgravity environment and as, if, as if you're doing an EBA in space, but how close does, is it to replicating that experience of, of a spacewalk? Uh, William, it, it is. Well, first, I want to add something to what Christy said. She talked about how important the spacesuit glove is. And I don't know if you noticed me sort of checking my knuckles. Uh, for years, I used to have a, have a little ex, kind of a, a larger knot right here on my hand from pressure points in the, <laughs> in, in the glove. And so, you, you know, you deal you, the, the suit. And, and so now I'm going to transition into talking about the fidelity the suit can be very uncomfortable. Um, it's got, you know, it looks soft on the outside, but the hard upper torso, the, the upper shell is exactly that. It is hard. It's a fiberglass shell. It's a fiberglass shell and it has a lot of hardware inside. And so if there are, and, and when you're in space, you float inside the suit. Well, when you're in the NBL, you and the suit collectively are neutrally buoyant because of the great work the divers do in doing the way out. However, it's a lot like being it's it's a lot like being on a ship or maybe in a submarine. A submarine is neutrally buoyant, but the sailors all walk on the deck in, internally. And so you inside the suit, your body is not neutral. You are pulled down by gravity. 
And so that's the big difference. The suit is actually less comfortable when you're in the NBL than it is in space. Now there's an advantage to, and, and what I found, and, and uh, Christy also talked about the different types of tools. She talked about the high fidelity tools. And a real great example is the PGT, the pistol grip tool, battery powered um, uh, uh, socket, uh, socket driver. Well, they have the ones in the NBL that you use are full, are, are very functional, that you can drive bolts with them and they weigh a ton. And so if you're, and fortunately you do have the lightweight mock-up, so you translate with those. And now as Christy said, you're, you get to your work site and you need to drive a bolt. So you hand the lightweight mock-up to one of the divers uh, the, a utility diver, and then the utility diver hands you the fully functional one. Well, if you're trying to hold it sort of overhead, it, it's, it now has its weight. And while you may be secure to the work site, there is a lot of, there's a lot of effort required working against the suit and holding this heavy tool up overhead, and you don't have that in space. In space, the tool, in fact, is weightless, whereas in the NBL, it really can't, you know, it really can't be. So the compensation in the pool working in the NBL is fabulous. Um, you learn the translation paths. You, you learn what body position you need uh, in order to perform a task. You become very, very familiar with how the tools work um, if you're, if you're, uh, deploying something um, off of the Z1 Trust, for example, you go through the full motion, all of the steps of the task you do in the pool. And so when you get to space, what you discover to your everlasting delight is that if you could do it in the pool, it is easy in space. Oh, that's fascinating. I'm curious, um, Danny, you had, were talking about the air mix that astronauts breathe, or I should say the divers breathe in the pool, and um, you, you called it nitrox. And so what exactly is nitrox? Is it a different kind of mix that a regular diver would use? And if so, why? So, yeah, it's, it's, we, it's enriched air nitrox, and we, we call it EAM46 because the percentage we use of uh, oxygen in the in the gas is 46 percent so it's 46 uh, percent oxygen 54 percent nitrogen and and the reason we use that at the nbl is because uh, the more oxygen you have in the gas you're breathing the less likelihood you're going to have the buildup of nitrogen bubbles in your blood when you're scuba diving uh, at depth and for prolonged periods of time uh, we have a, a real minimal uh it is, it is almost a non-existent hazard to a degree diving in an only a 40 foot pool. However, we are able to further mitigate that by having additional uh, oxygen in the gas that we're breathing. So, so I, to clarify, it, if you have nitrogen buildup, that's the bends, right? If they're divers who go to great depths and if the mix isn't right, they can develop what's called the bends. That's correct. It can it can be uh, you know, it's a diving related injury with too much nitrogen buildup in your blood, and, and they do refer to it as the bends. And fortunately for the NBL, we have a, a full medical team and medical staff out here to uh, be able to react to any type of emergencies we we could have uh, medical emergencies. We have a hyperbaric chamber and a hypobaric chamber uh, here at the NBL, uh, so that we have a team ready to support any kind of medical emergencies. If, if they were ever to happen. Unfortunately, the NBL, I can't remember a time where we actually had uh, a specific diving related uh, emergency like that where we had to put someone in our chamber. So, so an interesting, uh, an interesting complicating factor is the pressure in the suit. So if, uh, if a suited subject goes down to 40 feet and as Christy said, there's a four PSI differential uh, that is equivalent to another 30% depth. And so now the suited subject is seeing something closer to 50 feet. And if the test run is six hours, if the NBL didn't have this just great system where you're breathing nitrox, 
um, you really now the suited subjects in particular would have to start <laughs> to do, doing stage decompression during ascent, and that would really make the run long. That is fascinating, Bill, because I was curious about that, because I wondered if the pressure pressurization in the suit would affect the gas levels, right, and, and affect. And so are the astronauts also breathing nitrox? So it sounds like they, they are. Yes, they are. They breathe the exact same thing that the divers breathe. Wow, that is absolutely fascinating. I'm curious, Bill, about your training and at the Hydro Lab in Russia. Do they also use nitrox or is it not necessary because the pool isn't as deep? I am pretty certain they do not use nitrox, but I'll be really honest with you. I never thought to ask. <laughs> isn't that terrible? But, you know, the you know, but when you bring up the Hydro Lab, one of the things that just struck me as as just very it made me very comfortable in the Hydro Lab is the culture there. Uh, and, and because it was so similar to the culture in the NBL. And, and I will tell you, there, there, uh, I, I can understand why the why uh, uh, Danny and Christy uh, are so, I mean, just enjoy working there so much. It has to be one of the most positive work environments of any place I've ever been. Uh, it's just people obviously love what they're doing. Uh, they're just consummate professionals. And, and it just, uh, it was always a highlight uh, uh, while, while training to know that you got to spend a day at the NBL, you know, especially if you meant you weren't in the office. So I'm curious, uh, Christy and, and Danny, do you cross train at times with your colleagues at the Hydro Lab? Do, do those divers ever or some of their staff come to NBL and vice versa? We, we have had divers uh, go over to Russia before to, to glean uh, the way that they perform operations in the Hydro Lab. Uh, we've had uh, them come over here as well. Uh, so we take an opportunity uh, between the, the different organizations to, to learn from one another to see what best fits for uh, just like you know, Bill may have done with some of the Russian astronauts for their, some of their protocols and, and the way they perform operations in space. Uh, we try to take that opportunity as well at the NBL for, for other uh, folks that may do operations you know, similar to us, in particular the Hydro Lab. And something that's uh, kind of interesting is uh, when, I, when Valeri and I did our um, Orlon EVA, we actually used a number of uh, of NASA to, uh, EVA tools that may have had some special adapter uh, provided or some slight modification or, or something jury rigged uh, so that we could use them on the Orlon. So we used the we used helmet lights. Uh, we used the EMU helmet lights. Uh, we were able to attach a swing arm. Uh, it's a little attachment that go uh, attaches near the waist of the EMU that you can uh, use to hold a number of tools. Uh, we carried uh, PGTs uh, with, uh, we carried PGTs with us on the Orlon. And so uh, it was a very much a hybridization. And so there, there were NASA personnel uh, who were uh, assigned to the Hydro Lab uh, just to help integrate uh, the use, not only the use of US tools, but also if you were, because Valeria and I actually, when we did our, our Russian EVA, our first tasks were actually on the S0 truss. And so we actually had to go all the way uh, from uh, the Russian airlock, Pier, the Pierce module. We had to translate all the way across to the front, uh, the very front of, the, uh, of ISS to do, some, uh, to do some work there in the Orlon. Wow. Well, I have to say it was fascinating, uh, Christy, to see images of the next generation of space suit for EVAs. And we know that uh, with Artemis, we're returning to the moon very soon. In fact, Artemis 1 will be launching a scheduled launch later this year. And it's, it was interesting to see the design where the helmet seemed with the, the glass portion to provide the astronaut with much more visual field so you could really see much more. What are astronauts saying about the new suit? Are they saying, is it more comfortable? Is it easier to do the training in? What's some of the feedback about the new design? So I've heard, yes, it is much easier for them to move their arms around. They have a much wide, wider range of motion with their arms and their legs. 
in a regular EMU, they wouldn't be able to stoop down and pick something up off the floor and they wouldn't be able to reach across their chest like they can in the newly developed suit. So yeah, the, the feedback has been very positive and they like the big bubble that's, they're still working on the development of that. So that's not exactly what it's gonna look like, uh, the final stages of it, but they have a much wider field of vision and they don't have to wear the, the calm cap on the inside. They actually, their comms are just coming from behind them. So that's another level of, of comfort that they've had. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember who it was. I think it was might have been Woody Spring way, 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 way long time ago. Uh, but his chin strap uh, became uh, unsecured uh, from his uh, calm cap. And uh, you, you can imagine how <sighs> challenging that would be doing a spacewalk, trying to keep your uh, your your uh, earphones and your microphones in some position where they're still usable. Yeah, I can imagine if that happens in the pool, we just have to call an all stop. The test director will pull that astronaut out of the water and, you know, it's we're desuiting them. We're going to fix that problem and it's a good 30 to 40 minutes of a, a pause to the test. So it is a big deal. So I have to go back to something you all mentioned a couple of times and I'm curious how often this happens and it's a normal response in human beings about people throwing up. Does that happen often because of the pressurized suit or the exertion of being in the suit for a period of time? And it sounds pretty awful if that were to happen to you while you're in your suit. Bill, did you ever throw up in your suit? And how often, did, how often does, does it actually take place? Well, you directed that question at me. Uh, no, I never threw up in a suit. I, you know, I, I, gosh, I just was so lucky. I, I never, uh, I was never, I never threw up in space. So um, that was, you know, they, as they often say, it's better to be lucky than good. But, uh, but it does sound like a pretty, I mean, you know, bad enough in the NBL, but uh, gosh, uh, to have to deal with that uh, actually in space, it is pretty, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I've always, I've always thought that that people who become motion sick, and so, so, you know, you can either be, you know, have an illness and vomit, or you can become motion sick and throw up. And being in the suit for me was always such an intensely focused event. Um, it, it never, um, you know, you don't hear about pilots, you know, pilots, if they're at the controls, I've never heard of a pilot throwing up from motion uh, from uh, motion sickness and and so i think it's because you're so focused on what you're doing everything is everything all your senses are are in harmony so to speak and i and i think that's the same experience in the pool you're really so focused on what's going on um you know plus you're you're in a comfortable you're in a comfortable place from the standpoint of you know you're safe uh, you're surrounded by people uh, to help you if there's a problem. And so you have a, a strong sense of security, if you will. So the only times I've I've seen that be an issue, I've never seen an astronaut get nauseous or sick in the suit, but I have seen other people that have gotten in the suit, say for egress day or for other kind of training events where they're just developing something new and it's not an actual astronaut inside the suit. I have seen someone get nauseous before and need to be taken out of the pool and they say that it's just because there's a you know your visor is round and when you go <laughs> under the water it creates this fishbowl effect and it helps if you look down or focus on a point that's close to you like if you look down at the top of your DCM that's right here, you're displaying control module and just focus on something close to you that that helps but once they start looking around at their surroundings it kind of is whoa yeah. it, they have some issues with the motion yeah, yeah I, I think that's a lack of harmony between your physical cues that and, and the visual cues you're used to yep exactly now there's also a phenomena related to the to the uh to the visor and so 
what you have is the water on the outside and so the air on the inside. And so what you have essentially is a concave lens. And so um, I am, among other things, I suffer from presbyopia, which means that as I got older, I couldn't hold the I couldn't hold the newspaper far enough away. You know, you lose that ability to accommodate near objects. Well, this lensing effect of the visor exact exacerbates if you're nearsighted or if you or if you're just suffering, you know, your your eyes are getting older, the effect of the lens exacerbates that situation. And so that's when I started wearing glasses, when I realized I had to have bifocals in order to see things when I was in the EMU in the pool. And so eventually I had a special set. I had a special set of NBL glasses and I would put them on and everything was fuzzy. Now I could see the the patterns in my skin if I held my hand about two inches away from my nose. But once I was suited up, everything was fuzzy. And as I would get lowered into the water, it would be like this, this frosted glass was just peeled away and suddenly everything was clear. And so now if you have somebody who's just starting to experience that, that change in vision, now they go into the pool and suddenly think you're, what you're seeing isn't quite as clear. That is absolutely fascinating. I could speak to the three of you for much longer, but unfortunately we're coming to oh. the close of our time together. This has been an absolutely fascinating presentation. We've learned a tremendous amount about all the incredible work that takes place in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab and the experience of astronauts. It's so great to hear firsthand the experience of someone who has actually trained in the pool. I also want to acknowledge that Space Center Houston has very robust learning programs including our Space Center University program and our Executive Leadership program, Human Performance Accelerator Lab, and we engage the divers uh, and experts from MBL to actually create experiences in other pool facilities in the Clear Lake area. And we know firsthand about the quality of those experiences. So thank you all for your incredible work in advancing science learning, particularly in youth who work with us through Space Center Houston. So I want to thank our panelists today, um, Danny, Christy, and Bill for joining us and sharing your incredible experiences and really want to congrat uh, congratulate all of you on the incredible work that you do to advance learning and benefits to humanity. We look forward to seeing you all at a future Space Center Houston Thought Leader Program. Thanks for joining us.